morning. This morning we are actually going to get the polytunnel door fixed. So got the drill with me and also I found the sticky tape. I didn't have to buy any more. I did have some. So action stations on that. And then uh, I'm actually going to clear out some of the tomatoes because some of them are over. There's a lot of tomatoes to pick in there, but some of them, once I've picked them off, they're just not going to do anything else. So they're all going to come off. So a bit of polytunnel work. I uh, forgot to bring the stepladder with me, but luckily I bought somebody with longer legs than I have. So that's sorted. I'm just replacing the door with exactly the same thing again because it ended up working really, really well. I've said before that it was meant to be a temporary measure, this little roll up door with the uh, self adhesive Velcro to hold it down. But actually it's worked out brilliantly. And when I originally kind of drew up the idea of what I was gonna do with this polytunnel, the wooden frame inside this door uh, was meant to have, you know, like a proper door on it that you opened. But actually having a roll up door has been so much better because it doesn't have to go anywhere. You know, if I had an opening door, it would either have to open inwards, in which case it's awkward, or it would have to open outwards, in which case I wouldn't have so much space for, I would say herbs, but most of it's not herbs. It's mostly self-seeded calendula, but still I'd have less space on the outside. So the door is attached to the frame with polytunnel tape and a wooden strip at the top. And then it's rolled down. What holds actually the door in place is this uh, self-adhesive Velcro, which is brilliant stuff. So the adhesive side of it although it does stay pretty good obviously it's not strong enough on its own so I'm sticking the hook side of the velcro to the door frame in the right place and then using a staple gun to go straight through it into the wood just to give it a bit of extra strength because sticky outside you know it does eventually wear off I'm doing the hook side on the door itself because it's less flexible than you know the softer side of the velcro and then as I'm rolling the door up, you want it to be as kind of flexible and soft as possible. So it just makes sense to have the fluffy side there. Also, in the interest of making sure that the Velcro and the door lines up properly, I'm not sticking the fluffy side directly to the door. I'm putting it straight on the frame, keeping the adhesive side covered up for the time being. Just stick the whole lot down and make sure it's all in line. And then I will attach the door to that so that then when I roll it back up again, I know that it's all exactly in place. This is where assistance is called for. <laughs>
The broom handle serves two purposes being at the bottom of this door. Firstly, it provides the weight uh, to stop the door flapping around in the wind, which then takes the stress off the Velcro because the Velcro itself wouldn't really be able to hold the door flat. But with the broom handle, which extends by about 10, 15 centimeters on either side of the door at the bottom means that and when I put the pegs back in at either side, I can just hook it down and it's not gonna move anywhere. The other reason is that it gives you something to roll the door up around. So when you open the door, you roll it up around the broom handle all the way up to the top. And then there are two loops on either side which catch the ends of the broom handle and hold it up. Okay, finally, new door is installed. I don't have to think about that anymore haven't done the windows though but the windows were in a much better state than the door was and also the windows are going to stay shut basically for the whole of the winter now unless we get another warm burst so they'll probably be replaced in the spring unless I have a burst of enthusiasm uh, sometime soon <laughs> we do actually have enough velcro I think to do them so got the materials um, yeah so I'm gonna do a bit of clearing in here because you can see like for example this poor chap here um there is a tomato on it that needs picking but uh, that plant <laughs> is not going to be doing very much um so anything that looks like it's completely over i'm going to strip out of here now um there's actually so we haven't been inundated with tomatoes this year but one of the good things of that is that actually everything is kind of ripening up now and we don't have masses of green ones left over which is tick because I really really don't like green tomato chutney and I haven't found anything else to do with them uh, over the years and we've probably got about 30 jars of them in the kitchen from previous years still unopened still not eaten so that's something we really don't need any more of but because we didn't have any massive beefsteak varieties growing this year um, which wasn't great on that front but actually it means that you don't have any kind of leftover that aren't going to ripen in here so I'm just going to pick everything that I can it's a couple of split ones so uh, I'll probably just make a bit of tomato sauce with them pick all the rest of them not pickle pick all the rest of them uh, and uh, then clear out what is clearly finished the only ones that I know are definitely going to carry on for a little bit longer are the sun sun gold sun sun ripe sun gold sun gold you know like the little orange cherries um, I've got two of them and they're both still going strong so I'm going to leave them just tidy them up a bit all the rest of it's probably going to come out yeah
I'm also going to I'm also going to uh, dig out some of these chilies. They're not going to do anything else in here now. The night temperatures are too low. So I'm going to dig some of them out. Um, there's not that many in here, actually. Uh, one, two, three. There's about four I'm going to save. Um, peppers, I'm just going to pick the peppers off and get rid of the plants because um, they're not really going to do anything. Although a couple of them have small ones on. I might just leave them. Peppers are not my issue. Chilies, I've got one, two, three, four. I've got about six chilli plants in here. I'm going to save maybe three or four of them, uh, take them home, see if I can overwinter them. Um, didn't work last year, but you never know. <laughs> uh, I did actually just completely forget about them last year. So we've got, um, so they'll have a better chance this year anyway, just because I'm gonna try not to forget about them. Last year I stuck them under the table in, um, I cut them all back, stuck them under the table in the conservatory and then never thought about them again until I discovered them a couple of months later, just as dry sticks. <laughs> so that wasn't so good. But yeah, I'm gonna save a couple of these chili plants whip out the parsley and then uh, freeze what I can of that because uh, most of it is kind of going to seed now anyway so it's not that nice and I need the space so I'm going to do that yeah this parsley has been brilliant actually it is the one that I actually planted about this time or maybe some mid-November in here last year and it didn't do a great deal over the winter but come spring we've been picking this since about what April time and it's been fantastic. We had a couple bolt really early and the rest of them have just been ticking along. So this one is the really dense curly leaf one, Lisette, which I've found to be so much more reliable than the rest of them. But we did also have some of the big like Italian flat leaf in here and that went really, really quickly. So definitely got to get some more of this sown so I can get it in here for over winter and we'll try for the same next year. fantastically the camera managed to cut out while I was potting these up but you know how it works I just dug them out plonked them straight in these pots and I'm giving them a really good water because it's quite dry in the polytunnel the four that I've ended up saving are a Brazilian starfish a Bolivian bumpy a pineapple ahi and a orange habanero these are the four that I'm going to try and keep alive over winter they're all tiny plants. They're well and truly stunted from whatever happened earlier in the year with chili and tomato gate in the greenhouse. They're really, really short, but I am a tiny bit optimistic that I might get something out of them. So we've had no chilies at all this year. Peppers, yes, chilies, nothing. But these four are covered in flowers and immature fruit. So I'm hoping if I take them home, get them in the warm, we might just get something from them. Anything. Please, please. Something we're not short of, however, a chocha. <laughs> Good morning. What an absolute roller coaster this morning. So, do you remember my cat at home? So, not Lily at the allotment, but our cat at home, Annie, Anakin. Um, it's a boy. I know Annie's confusing. <laughs> he is a boy. Um, 
so he has uh, been up and down and up and down. And I don't know if you remember a couple of months ago, we were going to the vet all the time and it was sort of, um, is he going to get better? Is he not going to get better? Is this the end? Uh, anyway, the guy's 14 years old, nearly 15 years old. And I've had him with me since I was in France. And uh, I absolutely love that cat. And so when we came back from France, you know, when mum and I were in um, Epinay, uh, he was really ill when we came back. It happens really, really quick. It's a recurring thing. But this time he just wasn't getting better. And so he's been at the vet. Um, he was having to go every morning because he won't take the pills. It takes about three nurses to get him to take the blooming pills. It's just a nightmare. He's fine going to the vet. He's not stressed out or anything. He gets in his um, carry case, no problem. It's just actually getting the pills down him. He doesn't fight. What he does is he just holds them in his mouth and he spits them out when nobody's looking. So it's just a bit stressful. And he just, he's not eating is basically what it is. He's got a problem with his sinuses and there's something going wrong in here and he can't smell the food so he won't eat it. It's just, anyway, the last couple of weeks has been in and out of the vets pretty much every single day and or at least three four times a week and we, we gave him a deadline of uh 12 30 today um if he hadn't started eating again it just wasn't fair to keep him alive because he can't smell the food he won't eat it he's miserable um Yes, horrid, absolutely horrid. But um, so by 11.30 today, he still hadn't eaten anything. We've got so many strategies, I can't tell you. Like this house runs on trying to trick the cat into eating something, it's just nuts. But he hadn't eaten anything. And then um, he just got up on the stove and stole a piece of lamb. <laughs> I've never been so happy that my dinner's been stolen. I can't tell you, he certainly cut it fine. I mean, seriously, we're still gonna go to the vet. We're still gonna go and see, uh, we've got a fantastic vet up the road. Um, still gonna go and see her and uh, say the situation because obviously we've booked it in. Uh, but yeah, bloody, bloody cat. <laughs> Talk about cutting it fine. That's like, a, it's a stay of execution. I mean, he's not in any way, shape or form fixed or better. And it'd be a, from previous, it's gonna be a long road back to him being full health but just getting him to eat one thing on his own is huge it's huge which means that today is not annie's last day and i i did i couldn't be happier i could not be any happier so yeah we are off to the vets now to pick up some more uh pills some more food some more all the other things some more drops, some more antibiotics, some more everything else that he needs. But he's he's okay and he's eaten. The cat has eaten. Good morning, happy Friday. I am on the broad bean sowing mission today. I'm doing Aguadolfi Claudia, which is a brilliant overwintering variety of broad bean, throwing a bit of grow more in with the compost. And I'm actually gonna be starting them off in pots, which is totally not necessary. It's easily warm enough for them to germinate and be perfectly happy outside. The only issue I've got with that is that I often get uh, squirrels or mice or rats digging them up before they've actually germinated. So just to get them past that first hurdle, I'm going to start them in the root trainers and then plant them out when they've got a bit of green on them just to avoid that first digging <laughs> pest invasion that comes when you plant the broad beans out. It is also time for me to be sowing the field beans into the beds where we're gonna have the brassicas next year, but I haven't worked out what beds they are yet. And yeah, I just haven't got that far. So I'm just 
going with the broad beans today. I don't have a huge number of broad bean seed, unfortunately. I've got about what, 12, 14 of them, I think I counted. But I'm going to make up this whole set of root trainers because if you leave a gap, they all fall over and it doesn't really work. So I'll just have some empty ones on the end and I'll find something else to sew into them later on. These root trainers really do divide the crowd. Some people find them way too flimsy and because uh, they're quite expensive. But I found, I mean, we've had some of ours seven, eight years and they're absolutely fine. Even when they split in two, you can just put them back together because you use them as a whole um, unit. They kind of support each other. So it doesn't matter if they get a bit frayed, but I find them to be absolutely brilliant. But it depends, everybody likes different things, don't they? I am a root trainer fan. God, we are really channeling the autumn today. Next thing on the list is I'm gonna take in some of these bolotti beans. It'd be the first wave of picking of these. Some of these are really quite dry. Some of them aren't perfectly dry, but we've got two weeks of really soggy weather ahead of us. And I'm gonna take off what's kind of semi-dried just in case they start going moldy because that's not fun. It's the same reason that I brought in those ichikokuri because just it's gonna be so wet. It's, they're better off drying inside than they are out. Also, I don't want them to go too far over and then them split open like this one I've just spotted up here. We've lost the beans out of that. I should have picked that one a bit earlier. But most of these are absolutely fine and I'll be taking probably about a third of them and leaving all the fresh ones on because they're not in danger of going mouldy. I'd say that's probably about a quarter of them and I'm quite happy. Looking forward to shelling them actually, getting them frozen. Feels like an accomplishment when you start getting things in the freezer ready for the winter for like a nesting squirrel or something. <laughs> Another thing I'm going to get done today is the pots that had the cucumbers and the melons in. Cucumbers did all right, melons did absolutely nothing. 
there was a variety of reasons for that. Um, one of them was the heat, but also they were really stunted from when I was growing them at home initially. So what I'm going to do is they haven't used up the nutrients in this compost. It was fresh, you know, straight out of a bag when I put them in there. I'm going to tip all of this out to make sure there's no nasties in there and then use it to top up the soil in the polytunnel because the polytunnel soil is pretty much only half full and I want to just kind of bolster it up. Things in the polytunnel get fed so much that using sort of semi-old compost isn't going to be too much of a problem. I just need a bit of bulk in there because it's so shallow. Although that's enough space for the tomato roots to get a grip in, I mean, it's not a problem and you can grow tomatoes in, you know, um, grow bags, you know, which has got very, very shallow soil. It's more the fact that the more soil I've got in there, the better it's going to be at holding onto the moisture. So I want to get the beds really, really full before next spring when I'm planting the tomatoes out next year. That's the aim. And so all of this spare compost, I've put some of the compost from the potato bags in there and these potted up things, I will also just use the old compost in the hope of being able to kind of get a bit more bulk in there for next year. What I would normally do if I was filling the beds in here would be to put the new stuff as I'm getting it and then spread it across the whole of the beds that are inside the polytunnel. But unfortunately, I want to start planting out some stuff that I've got as seedlings in here that are going to be in here over the winter. And this soil is going to be coming in bits and pieces from as I'm clearing the plot. So what I'm going to do with this stuff is just push it all into one corner and raise the soil level in one corner of the polytunnel bed so that I can plant the chard straight through the top of that. And then I don't have to disturb it again. And then as I get more and more soil from various other places and other bits and pieces, I can, I can then raise the level across the whole of the beds, but just in bits and pieces, rather than planting out seedlings and then trying to kind of tuck soil around them and burying them so I'm just going to put it all in one corner that does mean that as I'm getting the soil from all these different places that there might be different kind of zones of soil quality in here which means that before I plant the stuff out for spring I will dig the whole lot over and kind of amalgamate the whole lot so it'll only be this first winter's growth season that the soil is all kind of compartmentalized So that's that corner pretty much done. So as you can see, like the soil level is quite different. Uh, it is what, maybe the depth of my hand, like the whole depth of that hand up, which is pretty good. So I'm gonna plant straight in to the top of that and then slowly fill the rest of the polytunnel as we go. Okay, these little chaps uh, are white stemmed chard uh, that should have gone out such a long time ago, or at least half of them. The idea was I was, I sowed quite a few, as you can see, um, and I was going to put half of them outside about a month ago <laughs> and, uh, and then hope for good weather. And then I was gonna pot up the other ones and plant them in here when I was ready to, but I didn't get the first stage out of the way. So what we've got is just crammed in sad little chard plants. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to, prick out about what 12 of them stick them in this patch of new soil and uh, give them a feed and hope hope <laughs>
did what, sorry? Yeah. Okay, commencing white rot dodging strategies. So white rot is a fungus which is born in the soil and it affects the allium family. And we've got it pretty much across our whole plot and it's horrible stuff. So your alliums look like they're growing really, really well. So that's all your garlic and your onions. And actually it doesn't seem to affect the leeks as badly, but onions and garlic, absolutely awful. And it just rots it out from the inside and you just basically end up harvesting stinky onion sludge which isn't what we're going for. <laughs> so we're trying this by going for fresh, unadulterated compost. Hopefully we're gonna get a good allium harvest. And I want to do my shallots and my garlic in this fresh compost. So I don't have my garlic cloves yet ready to go in the ground, but I do have my shallot set. So this is gonna be a bit of a hokey cokey, I think. So I was going to grow the shallots in here, but as I'm placing them, the way shallots grow is that they have a central one that you plant and then you end up with like a rosette of all these other shallots around the outside. So obviously you want to put them in a bit of a wide space and I'm trying to fit five shallots per window box here. And I think it's just going to be too tight. This is going to be much better for garlic. However, the other trough that I was going to use for the garlic, which I will probably now use for the shallots, is actually still got stuff in it, still growing, which is a big polystyrene box I've got in the greenhouse. So what I think I'm going to do is often people will start their shallot sets or their onion sets in little pots and then plant them out. I'm going to be using this like sort of a seed bed style thing. So I'll start them in here because this is the best place I've got to start them off. I don't want to start them off in the soil, obviously, because of the white rot. So they're going to crack on in here. And then when I clear the polystyrene box out and I've got the garlic sets ready to go, I will transfer these little chaps out. By then they should have developed a bit of root and a bit of green and I will plant them into the wider box. So they've got much more space to grow. And then I will get my garlic into these troughs. <laughs> that wasn't the original plan, but I think that's what I'm gonna end up doing because as I'm shifting these around, I'm realizing there just isn't enough space in here for the shallots. Well, cheers chaps. 
what a productive week. Surprisingly so. Seems the weather wasn't that great. Like it rained most of the week, but the couple of days that it didn't rain, yeah, got loads done. So pleased we got the polytunnel door fixed because like I said, although it's gonna be wet, it's still quite warm. Temperature's meant to dip quite a bit kind of at the end of the week. So it's good to be able to actually get that door closed because uh, it wasn't closing properly. So it was all sort of flappy and gappy. <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah that's fixed which is brilliant windows are still on the to-do list but they're not crucial but yeah loads of stuff happening in the polyton i'm really pleased i got rid of the tomatoes that were kind of um on their way out where i've planted the chard in that corner obviously there are still some tomatoes through there but i won't pull them so the ones that were like that i took out earlier i just yanked them out but the ones in there I won't, I'll just chop them off at the root so they don't disturb the uh, child that's in there. So that should all work out pretty well. Got the broad beans in, which is really good. Uh, that's like on my October to-do list and it's only, or is it only like the 17th or something, 16th of October. So yeah, <laughs> I got it dead bang in the middle of October. So that's, that's pretty good. It is gonna be a bit of a shuffle with those shallots. Obviously when I planted them in there, I wasn't thinking, oh, I'm gonna to have to move these. It was only afterwards um, when I was looking at the footage, I was just like, it's just too close together. It's just not gonna work. It's not so much that they are too close together, but to get them a wide enough distance apart in the trough, they have to be so close to the edge of the trough that you can't form, you know, it needs a big amount of space around it. But the other trough I've got will be perfect. So I'll just let them get started in there so that they get a bit of a head start and then get them in the trough shuffle shuffle you know it'll be fine it'll be fine <laughs> so a couple of things last week i forgot to say that i was going to be on um potty mouth gardeners club um like that monday evening so sorry backtrack um potty mouth gardeners club is like a live that's done by tony c smith on his channel although i think it, there's now a separate channel for the actual potty mouth gardeners club but it's like um like a live chat about gardening sort of thing and it always is on a monday evening at like seven seven o'clock on a monday which i always forget to announce it the week before on here because my vlog doesn't go out until the monday evening but if i but that's only to patreons so if i say it on the monday evening it's already a week too late for everybody else so i've got to get myself prepared to say it the week before but i will give plenty of notice next time and i'll put a link because although it's alive obviously the stream is like recorded and it's, it is available to watch on the channel so i'll put a link to that underneath here and talking of uh patreon so last week when we were talking about the spreadsheet the overwhelming majority of people were asking just for like a blank version of my spreadsheet now i just got to work out how to make that shareable um i think i know how to do it but i'm going to share it with my patreons when this video goes out uh, on Monday afternoon and just check that they can download it and use it and check that my instructions work. And then if that does work, then it should all be up at the bottom of this video um, when I've got it. And if it isn't ready to go then, then I will do it as a community post. So it will come up and then it will be attached to the bottom of the future videos. So um, I will let you know what's happening with that. But yes, gonna just make a blank so everyone can use it. But yeah, overall, like the most, the, the biggest thing that's happened this week is that Annie has continued to eat. Uh, he's still stealing stuff. He's such a, I mean, it's all psychological problems with him. It's not just physical. Uh, he, he has a real problem eating out of his, when he gets this illness, um, he then refuses to be out of his own bowl and we have to like hide food in the kitchen, like up on surfaces so that he thinks he's nicking it and then he'll eat it. It's just but it's worth it and he's starting to fatten up a bit now so uh, we will be back at the vets tomorrow uh <laughs> again i basically live there i should be paying rent oh i pay more than rent to be honest yeah that's not it's not cheap is it going to the vet every other day <laughs> but I, I really couldn't face it i mean i love that cat so much and having just lost mills and yeah i just couldn't god it was awful but he's okay he's okay so don't have to think about it for a little while just yet, as long as he continues to eat and get fat again, we're all good. And yeah, I think that is about it for this week, chaps. Next week, what are we doing? I'm gonna be doing more sewing. I've gotta make a decision on whether I'm gonna try and overwinter peas or not this year. Although the ones that I started really, really early, what was it like? 
the beginning of February worked brilliantly this year. So I might just do that rather than trying to get them to overwinter. Um, or I could try overwintering as well. I've only done overwintered peas a couple of times and uh, it wasn't that successful. But then again, if I've got the space, maybe I should do it. And uh, field beans. Field beans is something I really do need to get in. I don't know if you remember last year when I had the like the timing issues, the ones that I got in like at um, mid to end of October did absolutely brilliantly. And the ones that I waited to the first week of November completely failed. So I do have to get them in. It's just a case of, because I put the um, field beans in the beds that the brassicas are gonna go in the next year because they're nitrogen fixers. You've got to kind of make a decision about where you think you're gonna plant your brassicas next year. And that kind of coincides with where did we have them last year? Plus where am I going to have space enough to get the field beans in? Because at this time of year, when you're supposed to plant the field beans, like mid-October, actually everything's still in the bed. So even like the courgettes and the squash and everything are all still going strong. So I can't really plant it in there. <sighs> it's just logistics, isn't it? Allotmenting is logistics. Anyway, chaps, I think that's about it for this week. Uh, I will say a happy Monday to those marvellous people on Patreon and happy Tuesday to everybody else. I hope you have a stunning week. And uh, yeah. See you next time.